Well, thanks very much, Bill, for uh, all that flattery. Uh, I'll take it wherever I could get it, but for the sake of this debate, flattery will get you absolutely nothing. So this year I've been assigned the position anti-TNF should be used before veto lizumab for moderate to severe IBD. And I'm very grateful to the planners of this meeting to give me this particular position. In the past, I've been given less um, uh, robust positions and my disclosures as pertains to this talk is here. Uh, two of these three, as you know, are uh, manufacturers of anti-TNFs and the last is of the uh, vitalizumab. So in the past, I've not been given such uh, defensible positions. For instance, those of you from last year may remember the debate that I was assigned. 22 years old, uh, severe UC failing, five days of IV steroids. My opponent's position, treat immediately, th immediately with infliximab, five mix per kg, and subtotal colectomy if no improvement in five days. And I was given 22-year-old severe UC failing, five days of IV steroids. Order bedside commode. <laughs> if that doesn't help, prescribe kosher diet. <laughs> so this year, fortunately, I'm giving the, uh, the better position, obviously the winnable position. I come from uh, Mount Sinai, where I have been blessed to have been mentored by Henry Janowitz, Dan President, David Sacker, Jerry Way, and now with the arrival of the, uh, my new boss, Bruce Sands, who's been absolutely terrific, and he's uh, recruited uh, three world-class stars, John Fred Cohen Bell, uh, Judy Cho, and Marla Dubinsky. I figure I'm well prepared to do this debate. On the other hand, I learned that I was uh, positioned against Bill Sanborn. You never knew that Bill Sanborn was a blue-eyed, blonde-haired surfer dude, and that's why he always shows this uh, opening slide. This is from uh, his new home. But on the other hand, he's not just a surfer dude. Who is Bill Sanborn? Well, this is what I'm up against. Um, one of 496 papers. This is the guy I'm really up against. How about... Bill Sanborn and infliximab, well, 102 papers already. So we know what he's really thinking. Adalimumab, another anti-TNF, another 51 papers. What does he really think about vetolizumab? He's only gotten around to four papers. <laughs> okay? So the, the manufacturers of the uh, vetolizumab drug, they figure they'll go down and discuss things uh, with Bill. And initially, I was assigned the Vitalizumab first position. So the executives of the company went down to the beach and they had a beach party. And you could see this is not exactly the A team of their executives. But then they heard that Bill was assigned Vitalizumab, and this is what it looked like. So let's go to Ulcerif Clias and talk about the data. Bill spoke a lot about the toxicity, and that's because there's not a lot of good data uh, for efficacy. So what is it? Let's talk about anti-TNF therapy versus vetolizumab in ulcerative colitis. So here we see the ACT-1 trial, and I'll suggest to you that if you always look at the bottom right-hand corner of these slides, you'll see a familiar name there that supports all of my data, Bill Sanborn. Clinical response at week eight, 69% for five milligram per kilogram infliximab. How about Vito when you see efficacy at six weeks? 47%, 70 versus 47. And we hear a lot about that this is, in UC at least, a rapidly working drug. But if you look carefully, you see that the curves don't really start to separate in the Mayo score until about week 30. So the drug has plenty of time, and you don't see that separate until week 30. It's important when we look at both the UC and the Crohn's trial, when you look at the maintenance phase, that you look at what is really being reported. In the, uh, in infliximab studies, the patients are treated straight through. So you see the 54-week data based on how many patients came in, regardless of how they did throughout. You didn't select out for responders. Whereas in the veto trials, you're selecting out for the week six responders. When you're looking at maintenance, only those patients who had responded by week six went on in the study. So a clinical response at week 54, this is maintenance for infliximab, 45%. If you look at it for veto, clinical response, if you multiply their 42%, for their Q8 weeks by their 47% Q6 week dosing, those are the patients who got randomized, it's down to 20%, 45% versus 20%. If you look at remission, and these are patients who's treated straight through in Act 1, 38% at 54 weeks, treated straight through, 38 compared to 47% times their 21%, 10%, 35 versus 10 for the week 54 data. Mucosal healing, and again, just look down on any right-hand corner of these slides, who's taught us all about this? 
Bill Sanborn. Mucosal healing, we all know how important it is. We don't treat based on symptoms. We want to treat based on mucosal healing, the true biological uh, impact. So what do we have at week 54? Treating straight through with infliximab, uh, five mg per kg, 45%. Treating through with uh, vetolizumab, if you multiply through the 47% responders at week six, 24%, 45%, 24%. I think the message here is extraordinarily clear. And it's not just a short acting quick fix, these uh, anti-TNFs here. You see if you responded uh, at uh, one year, you could follow them out and almost 90% maintain that response. It's not only for infliximab. Here you see adalimumab in UC. And again, if at one year you're doing well, you could go out an additional three years, and about 90% of those patients are still doing very well. So it's pretty clear here, even in the uh, disease that would, you would think favors vetolizumab for positioning, the data is pretty uh, scant. Crohn's disease, where we saw from uh, talks this morning, it seems even less impressive, particularly in induction. So what's the data? Response at week four. So again, these are patients who got a single dose of their anti-TNF. For infliximab, the remission was 46%. For adalimumab, 35%. So it's called 45 and 35. For vetolizumab, this is now patients at week six who got two doses. So there's not in favor of a uh, induction regimen for infliximab. They got a single dose. Here you get two doses, induction at six weeks, 15%. Okay, so we're seeing the same consistent 20% delta in just about every story. How about clinical remission? 17%. Clinical remission with prior anti-TNF failures. We hear how it works just as well in anti-TNF failures, perhaps, as in those who are anti-TNF naive. I don't know, 10%. How about uh, the most uh, important combination of therapies that we've all sort of recognized and accepted is the way we want to treat our patients if we want to get them well, the quickest and the most durable uh, remission. Uh, Sonic, week 50, 40% steroid-free remission with combination therapy. If you look at week 26 and you really parse out those patients who truly had active disease, and you take away all the uh, fake CDAI elevated patients who didn't have real disease. So look at the real patients with inflammatory disease. Infliximab in combo works even better. In fact, it's 70% at week 26, and at week 50, 50% are still in a steroid-free remission with a high inflammatory burden, 50%. Again, in the Crohn's disease trial, it's biased in its uh, design to take patients who had responded by week six and then treated through to week 52. How did those patients look? Clinical remission, 12%. We saw for combo therapy, 50%, and for monotherapy with infliximab, about 40%. Here we're at 12% when we're multiplying through those six-week responders. In a steroid-free remission, 10%. Vitolizumab, this is a, the more recent paper. Again, you see a familiar name on the bottom right-hand corner. Vito, an anti-TNF exposed patients in Crohn's disease. Uh, Bill just referenced this, page, this paper by Bruce Sands and Gastro a couple months ago, looking at specifically those patients who were TNF failures, a whopping 15% remission rate compared to 12%. Not terribly impressive there. So I think we've proved pretty emphatically that when you uh, put them side by side, it's nice to talk about toxicity, but why use a very safe drug that's not going to be effective as a drug that we've had now for 16 years, a class of drug? What additional data do we have to guide the use of Vito as opposed to the anti-TNFs? What are our clinical trial results on Vito-Lizumab and combo therapy, which we all recognize is the most potent effect? Zero. How about clinical trial results in IV steroid refractory UC? You saw from Bruce early this morning, CISIF, the very uh, important, potent benefits, very rapid with uh, anti-TNF, with Vito, zero data. How about, and we've learned again from Bill in large part, the importance of therapeutic drug monitoring and dose escalation to achieve therapeutic doses. What's the data with Vito Lizumab? Zero. So to end up with a concept that was uh, just published again by a Dr. Sanborn in the American Journal of Gastro, we really should be moving forward in the year 2014 and on towards a more personalized medicine approach to the management of IBD. What was said in the conclusion, risk profiling is a fundamental concept that should be used to guide initial selection of treatment. Initial selection of treatment. High-risk patients should receive the best 
treatment available that currently is a TNF antagonist in combination with a thiopurine. I did a search on this slide, did not find the word vetolizumab. Who wrote this? Sanborn, July. The drug was approved. You'll say, well, gee, Vito's a new drug, approved May 20th. So with all this data and all this data that Bill has provided me, I want to thank him. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>